third speaker for this morning's session is Henry Weiswellner. Henry learned his trade as a sports physiotherapist at the AIS in Canberra and the Olympic Park Sports Medicine Centre in Melbourne. Through working with elite Olympic rowers, he developed a specialty in the management of spinal pain. Henry completed the Australian College of Physiotherapy Fellowship exams in 2007, being one of the first to qualify as a specialist in sports physiotherapy. His current position is a clinical manager and the specialist physiotherapist at DMA Clinical Pilates Physiotherapy in South Yarra. And Henry's just recently become the coordinator of the Masters of the Sports Physiotherapy course at La Trobe University. His presentation today will cover this evidence base and reveal his practical approach to devising effective back exercise programs. Thank you, Henry. I'm going to talk to you about only one thing, one aspect of chronic low back pain and the specific problem being degenerative lumbar disc disease and show you which exercises I believe are the most effective uh, to use for that condition. So it's a specific diagnosis. So what I'll do is give you some definitions to begin with so we're both, we're all on the same page and show you what I believe is new, particularly in the area of uh, imaging of degenerative disc disease and why that matters, what the clinical implications of that are. And I'll, I'll uh, describe to you a case study, show you my uh, favorite exercises for this condition and give you some recommendations. The acknowledgements, DMA Clinical Pilates Physiotherapy and the Back in Motion Health Group. There are a whole lot of people that help me put these ideas together and help me produce the movies. Craig Phillips for introducing me to Pilates, and which I'm sure has prolonged my career as a physio. I mean, look at me. <laughs> uh, I do Pilates myself and uh, it's helped me physically as well as in my career. Jason and all the team at the Back in Motion Health Group and uh, some of the clinics that we did the movies at. Lauren Bugden, who is a terrific model for the movies, and La Trobe University for, for allowing me to be here. Okay, I won't bore you with the definition of chronic low back pain, but I will alert you to this uh, one concept that according to Hangai in this uh, paper, American Journal of Sports Medicine, one episode of severe low back pain in a young athlete uh, hugely increases the chance that that athlete will develop degenerative disc disease in later life. So most of the young athletes that you're treating now for their severe episode of low back pain will probably go on and develop degenerative disc disease. Um, and let me give you my definition of exercise. Who, by the way, recognizes this? What type of individual is this? Anyone? A Kalihari Bushman, that's and, right. And they now the Kalihari Bushman, the way they obtain their food, they basically hunt their, the animal down to exhaustion uh, in the desert. They, they run a marathon and when the, uh, the kudu, which is, which is the, uh, uh, the, the, the deer, uh, finally drops from exhaustion, the Bushman just shoots a poison tipped arrow into the animal uh, with, a, with a little bow and arrow. And compare who, who can tell me what the main difference in physique is between these two people? And it's not a trick question. <laughs> Sorry? That's very good. Go, where are you? Excellent. Steatopygia is a genetic, it's an, it's an inherited uh, overdevelopment, if you like, of the gluteal muscles. Now, the point being, the point I'm trying to make here is to get from this to this, you have to train. You have to train daily, and the exercise programs that I'm going to describe to you must be done often enough, repeated often enough, and done intensively enough to get a training effect. And sports physiotherapists know this very well. Athletes need to train to improve and to get uh, control of their problems. What's known about which exercise work best for chronic low back pain? We know all the systematic reviews repeat the same message that exercise is effective, uh, but 
at this point, there's no evidence to show that one type of exercise is clearly more effective than another. So that's our sort of starting basis point. And the other things that are unknown are whether we should use specific tailor-made exercises or whether general exercises work just as well. They both seem to work just as well at this point. It's unknown whether it's better to work in a group or individually. I suspect it's better to work in a group because there are some advantages there, I believe, in terms of compliance. And it's unknown whether it needs to be a physio to deliver these exercises or somebody else. I suspect it's better if it is a physio uh, prescribing and supervising exercises because we are the ones that understand the anatomy, the pathology, and can link the exercises to those, to those ideas. Now, the new thing that has influenced me a lot in terms of translating research into clinical practice is what's found now on kinetic MRI. A kinetic MRI is dynamic MRI or open core MRI. Uh, they all, the terms are synonymous. And it's an MRI image that's taken either in standing or, or sitting or lying supine. So you're not actually moving within the MRI sh machine. You're still taking a static image. But the images that we see of the lumbar spine with kinetic MRI actually, I believe, ch changes the knowledge about the, the way the spine behaves with movement. And it does explain why certain exercises might be better in the context of degenerative disc disease than others. So here's an image of an open core MRI machine. To my knowledge, there's only one in Australia. Does anyone know where it is? Blacktown in New South Wales. It's the only one that's uh, available to the public. So you can see you can stand up in it, uh, you can sit down in it, and you can also be imaged in supine. Kinetic MRI finds things that are not seen on static MRI. And there's, uh, the first thing is there's a higher incidence of spondylolisthesis seen in standing views than are evident in supine. So here are two images, and they're the same spine. Uh, this image is taken in supine. You can see the beginnings of a black disc here. I'll talk about the black disc in a moment. And the same spine imaged in standing, which is obviously showing this spondylolisthesis. So this paper talks about a higher incidence of spondylolisthesis, greater than three millimeters, in a, in a population of low back pain. So wh what do we think, you know, the normal incidence of spondylolisthesis might be eight or 10 percent, perhaps more in, more in athletes, depending on their sport. It's more. In, in degenerative disc disease, it's one in, five one in five individuals, according to this research. And the second paper here by Zhao et al. Missed lumbar disc herniations diagnosed with kinetic imaging. So you see more um, pathology in the disc in uh, sitting and standing than you do in supine. Now, the, the, the seminal paper, I believe, and the one that's influenced me the most is what happens to the disc, the, the way the disc behaves as it degenerates. So here are five images, and this is the Furman classification of disc degeneration, okay? A is normal. B is you no longer have a homogeneous uh, white, which is obviously the fluid in the disc. C, the disc is going gray and starting to desiccate. D, the disc is going black and is desiccated. And E, the disc has collapsed. Dynamic MRI research shows that as the disc degenerates, it bulges more in extension than it does in flexion. So the way the disc deforms reverses from the acute disc injury, and it's a different world when it's a chronic disc injury. It's actually the opposite. The degenerated disc changes in the way it responds to movement, and the severely degenerated disc bulges more in extension. So you can't manage an acute disc injury the same as a desiccated disc or a chronic uh, worn out disc. 
and I believe patients with degenerative disc disease, they lose their flexion, not always because of fear of flexion in the way that uh, we've just seen in some of the movies that Peter showed us, but they get stiff in flexion, they need to regain that movement and that's their dysfunction. It's like a flexion dysfunction and they need to regain their l active lumbar flexion. You know when somebody comes with a stack of MRIs and they may have been to their GP or, or uh, their orthopedic specialist and the, that doctor has held up the scan and they go, oh, oh my God, you've got a black disc. I love the black disc. <laughs> I think the black disc is great. The black disc is misunderstood, similar to the Dark Lord himself. He's misunderstood. And I'll explain why. A man called David Prowse, I'm going to digress for a little bit, but I'll come back, don't worry. David Prowse is an English actor, a bodybuilder and weightlifter who played Darth Vader in the three middle episodes of the franchise. He was a really tall, good-looking guy, well-built guy. His previous roles included Frankenstein's Monster, Bride of Frankenstein. The wedding scene sticks in my mind. I don't, still don't know how they did that. And he also played in a movie called A Clockwork Orange. Who has seen that movie? Yes, it's a classic, isn't it? Now, who can tell me what role he played in A Clockwork Orange? This is for bonus points. He played a physiotherapist. And he played a physiotherapist so well that when George Lucas saw the film, A Clockwork Orange, he offered him, he offered him a choice of roles. He offered him the role of a Wookiee or the villain, Darth Vader. And David said, well, I don't really want to play any more masked roles where I'm in all this makeup. I'm going to play the villain. Little did he know that he was going to wear a mask and a helmet for the whole, for the whole uh, series. And of course, we know that Chewbacca eventually played himself. But uh, what happened, uh, David, really his voice couldn't really cut it. And uh, he said to George Lucas, George, you know how I'm doing all the dialogue in these movies. My voice is muffled behind the mask. What are we going to do about that? And he actually had a quite a high-pitched voice and was like, um, no, Luke, I am your father. <laughs> and it really wasn't going to cut it. And George said, don't worry, David. When we get back to the studio, we'll get you in and we'll over overdub uh, all the dialogue. But that didn't happen. Of course, we know James Earl Jones uh, was edited in and he was the voice of Darth Vader. So that was a bit of a blow to David's, David's ego. The other thing that happened is, you know, somehow in his contract, there were no residual payments. So people like uh, Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, Mark Hamill, all those people were paid residual payments, which meant they got a percentage of all the merchandising. And, and as the franchise grew, those people made a lot of money. Uh, however, David, somehow that got completely left out of his contract and he didn't get a cent after he finished the acting in the role. And then to add insult to injury, the third thing that happened, what, when Darth Vader was finally uh, unmasked in the Return of the Jedi, they digitally put somebody else's head in there. Uh, it was a guy called Stephen Shaw. So, look, David thought he was a little bit hard done by, and I can understand that. And he, uh, you know, started to behave in kind of strange way strange ways at conventions and at movie openings, he started to become very rude. And George Lucas got really sick of him and basically cut him, cut him off and uh, he, he, he got, lost the roles. Anyway, he was, he was misunderstood. I think he should have just stuck to playing the role of a physiotherapist that he was very good at. And I think when you, you start to understand why people with degenerative disc disease start to get more pain just standing, walking, they can't carry anything. They can't even lie flat in bed after a while. They also hurt in sitting, but I think the sitting is because that's compression. It's not necessarily because they're in flexion. 
and it also explained to me why certain types of exercises work for really chronic back pain and others will not. Basically, extension will not work for these types of degenerative disc diseases. Now, when you look at people like this, this is a sort of a similar movie to what Peter showed you, but uh, these people have lost their lumbar flexion. They may not have the fear of flexion syndrome that Peter was describing. They've just lost their flexion and you see the flat back scenario when they, when they bend forward. They need to regain their flexion articulation and get their vertebrae moving as links in a chain rather just as a block of wood. They need to do that with, not with passive exercise, but with active exercise. So here's a case, a pharmacist, her job involves standing all day, really long shifts. She had an acute discogenic episode 18 months prior, uh, prior to her presenting to me. And, now, and she came complaining of pins and needles in both feet with prolonged standing, aching and tightness in the lower back and both buttocks. She was, she was a, it was a work-related injury. She was on restricted duties and could only work very short shifts. She'd been having physio, she'd been having Pilates exercises, extension exercises, that what they were not helping her. So she was taken through a series of exercises and I'm gonna show them from easiest to hardest. The first one I start people on is a easy pelvic tilt in this sort of sitting, relaxed, sitting position to start to get that articulation and flexion movement happening. Then they do a thing called a C curl or a, Craig calls this a spine stretch. They start to get that lumbar flexion articulation and bring in the abdominal muscles. Then a half roll or a half roll back. So they're starting to use more abdominal activation as they're working on their flexion articulation. And you'd be surprised, people who can't do passive hip knee flexion lying supine can often do this exercise pain free. Then we use the equipment to support the movement. You're on the trap table, you're using the upper swing bar. This is an assisted curl up. So you're getting assistance from the springs to do a flexion sit up. People who can't do a normal sit up can often do this really comfortably. They're doing a seated leg press, which is really more of a control exercise, still a flexion biased exercise. And some home exercises, chair stretch with the knees apart. When you do this, this is a McKenzie exercise, people will recognize. But when you do this with the knees together, I think that goes more to your lumbar spine and less through the hips. Uh, you can use a Swiss ball, a physio ball, roll it up the wall. So now you, you can do that with your knees together or knees apart. And you're getting that flexion load to the lumbar spine that's involved with that. That's the same as doing a trap table leg press, either doing it with the legs together or the legs apart. Those of you who use Pilates will be familiar with these. Now we're going up to a higher level. This is the first time the girl's actually tried the exercise and she's doing very well. But it's a stretch, it's a, it's a neuromeningeal stretch and it's a controlled flexion exercise. You can use the reformer to start doing your neuromeningeal stretches. So this is a version of a single leg press with slump where you're holding on to the end of the carriage. This is Sheridan from back in motion in Sydenham. A double leg use of the reformer and a version of the tendon stretch for people who are still a bit stiff. They can use the towel and get that flexion stretch happening. And then you use the towel here to cue the person to start flexing through the tummy first instead of keeping their lumbar spine extended as they go forward. And this is the cat stretch. So you do need two people here to operate and execute the, the exercise. So that's Luke, Con and Sheridan working together. A little bit of traction and a bit of flexion articulation. 
and the home copies of those exercises that uh, the half roll back, a version of a high stomach pull that you can do at home and then it starts to look like the down dog exercise in yoga, it's like a version of a high stomach pull. So after going through this series of exercises over a period of three months, uh, this, this lady, the pharmacist, was able to return to work on her full shifts. And I'm not really talking about research in this presentation, but I did present the results of our randomized, randomized trial on Thursday, where we used this approach and found that it was effective for people with chronic low back pain when it was delivered by a physiotherapist. Now, here are some recommendations. Which exercise is best? Well, it's the hello factor is you've got to do the exercise often enough. So there's co the, the, the compliance factor. And I believe people are more compliant when they're in a group. You can see this group of individuals, not one of them is really going to break, or he might <laughs> break ranks uh, because they're in a group together. And he would be ostracized, wouldn't he, if he, <laughs> if he broke ranks? I think there's also a bling factor that people like to come into a nice, clean studio, not a sweaty, smelly gym environment with a, with a nice sort of environment. And uh, that helps, I think. There's a bit of a bling factor. And there's this, a little love is needed. Tom Jones, who we all, we all know and love, a new album he's got, is, there's a song on there called Little Love. These people, in our trial, we found that most of these people had had a, low back pain for an average of 14 years. That's a long time talking to your parents, your, your family, your GP. They're not listening anymore, and it's important for you as the physiotherapist to give a little love, listen, and then, but don't let that get in the way of you prescribing the exercises. And I don't think you should exercise into pain. Did, can anyone sort of tell me the point of this exercise? <laughs> this is an extension exercise. I think it's gonna end in tears. It looks like open chain exercise to me. But in the trial, we actually didn't push people beyond a, uh, an NRS rating of four out of 10. I think you don't push people into pain and to keep them motivated and keep them working on. Now I know Evelyn's gonna give a talk a bit later about the direction specific aspects of this, but the exercises need to be done enough, often enough to induce a training effect and I believe in, for some individuals, the accuracy of direction is crucial. For others, it may not be, and we, we don't know yet how to, how to classify them accurately. So here's the statement or the take home message. I think active flexion is best for chronic low back pain when it's due to degenerative disc disease. And uh, this is my youngest daughter, <laughs> Freya. She likes this dress because it, it hides the nappy uh, we need more work now on accuracy of direction classification and to see whether the structure of the pathology matters and whether we can accurately pre-classify patients to see whether which ones will respond to certain types of treatment. And I think we also should be thinking about testing combination treatments because as physios, we're the experts of combining manual therapy, exercise and cognitive therapy as well. So in conclusion, these are the things I tried to go through with you and my recommendations. I think David, as I said, should have stuck to physiotherapy. Thank you.